Welcome back to AgriTalk at the American Coalition for Ethanol Conference in Des Moines. We're very happy to have with us uh, former Congresswoman Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, and we've been talking about uh, whether or not she enjoys not being in the fray right now, the mess that is Washington, D.C., the dysfunction that is Congress, or does she wish she was right in there trying to, to get things uh, done and, and changed? And your answer was? Well, right now I think I have the best of both worlds. I'm getting more time with my family, particularly my two-and-a-half-year-old son, uh, but also having opportunities to continue to work with people in the ethanol industry, looking to advance a renewable energy across this part of the country and to other regions of the country. Uh, very grateful to folks like Ron Fagan and Fagan Inc., who gave me the opportunity after the last election to continue to work closely with him and his team, as well as with the rest of the industry. We've got exciting breakthroughs out there, uh, exciting opportunities, but we know that there are some new realities, and a lot of it's budget-driven. There are some ideological forces that have been longtime detractors of the ethanol industry, and we continue to need to work together to work through those challenges and seize the opportunity that are presenting themselves. Yeah, no, that is your message. I think it's a good one. Ethanol has to broaden its coalition, has to broaden its base of support, bring in more partners. Well, even when we were passing the Energy Policy Act of 2007, and we had the Renewable Fuels Standard, the second version of the Renewable Fuels Standard, at the time, President Bush, and I had a conversation uh, with him directly about it, and certainly with uh, the Speaker of the House at the time, Nancy Pelosi, where there was agreement between the two in support of the Renewable Fuels Standard and all of the targets. And we tried to work to adjust those targets on a reasonable time frame, looking at what the current corn and ethanol industry could do and what time Time frame and how they were expanding, but also cellulosic ethanol for both former President Bush, former Speaker Pelosi. Cellulosic ethanol uh, was a key to them in bringing together a bipartisan coalition to support some of those advanced biofuels and cellulosic targets. Because of some of the challenges in the economy, uh, as well as perhaps uh, not managing expectations about sort of how we could move to that as aggressively as we might be able to, using the existing ethanol industry as a foundation to grow toward that, uh, as well as challenges to try to deny market access uh, to advanced biofuels and cellulosic ethanol. I think I think that's really where we have to focus our efforts so that more regions of the country, in addition to how rich a biomass opportunity we have here in the, in the Midwest, continues to be, but in the Pacific Northwest, in the Southeast, on the coasts, and that's some of what I'll be talking about today in terms of the research uh, breakthroughs, the private sector breakthroughs, uh, some of where the federal government continues to put resources and allocate assistance through loan guarantees and grant programs, but also some of the environmental implications and public health effects uh, that I think we need to continue to look at more intently and what that may do to provide a market-based handle to pull through advanced ethanol and cellulosic ethanol through into the supply chain. As unfair as it seems to many of us that are supporters of the ethanol industry, uh, the reality seems to be a willingness by Congress to cut support for the ethanol industry and unwillingness to cut those supports and incentives for the oil industry. So if that's the reality moving forward, how does the ethanol industry think deal with it? I think we have to acknowledge some of the political realities and the budget-driven realities that exist. Uh, but, you know, we, we can't continue to just be back on our heels. Right, we got to go on the offense here. Uh, clearly, it's been a challenge where for years we've had folks that have questioned uh, the efficiencies of the fuel itself in the production process. We've had folks now question and perpetuate the myth of food versus fuel. We've had now folks questioning the shortfalls in the cellulosic targets in RFS2. But we have a very good story to tell in what we have done to reduce taxpayer subsidies in loan deficiency payments and countercyclical payments because we finally have a price over the cost of production for farmers throughout our part of the country. We have a good story to tell on what that's meant for job creation in rural communities throughout this region. We have a good story to tell on breakthroughs at our national laboratories as well as our universities and what that means for biomass and transportation fuel in other parts of the country. We have a good story to tell on what all of this means in loosening the grip of foreign oil and our addiction to it in this country. And I think that we need to look at uh, the aromatics issue. You know, what's in the fuel? Dave Vandergren and his, his team have done a great job. He'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Uh, but when you talk about subsidies, there are some hidden subsidies going on to the oil and gas industry uh, through the lack of effective regulation, uh, through authorities that were given to the EPA in the 1990 Clean Air Act. Now, I know the EPA understandably not no one's best friend. Uh, but, you know, I'm raising my son part of the time in an urban environment. 
And if I get information showing that an agency that is charged with addressing really dangerous emissions hasn't been doing its job, and at the same time we've been adopting policies that actually have made that problem worse, and that they seem to be so focused on regulating uh, stationary sources of emissions that affect potentially our electricity rates more so in our part of the country than elsewhere, but they're not being nearly as aggressive as it relates to regulating mobile sources of emissions that are causing all kinds of health problems for children's and children and adults. That research is coming out that's raising serious questions and I think presents an opportunity uh, for the ethanol industry to join forces with consumer and public health advocates to be a replacement to some of those aromatics to make a difference uh, in the quality of life for people in all regions of the country. And before I let you go, your thoughts on the Super Debt Committee, what you think they may come up with, and, and ultimately, as we look at it from an agricultural standpoint, going into the writing of the next Farm Bill, what do you think is going to happen as far as ag spending and can we preserve uh, some form of a safety net that uh, will work for agriculture? Well, as you'll recall, we had quite a time in 2008 in reauthorizing the Farm Bill to keep different regions of the country together on the House Agriculture Committee, but we did it and we were able to come to over, overcome two vetoes and we had a good bipartisan bill uh, that did a lot of good things in terms of preserving a safety net in Title I, but also made some important investments in the energy title. We've got some folks on the Agriculture Committee in the House that have already made statements on the record uh, that if there's no baseline for a program, then that's probably not going to be in a reauthorization. Well, that puts the entire, entire energy title at risk. That's very disconcerting. It was very disconcerting to me to find that over the past number of months, one of the rare areas of agreement between Republicans and Democrats, between the White House and the Congress, between both chambers, seemed to be to cut the safety net and to put at risk uh, some of the progress that we have made uh, in reducing the amount of LDPs and countercyclicals that we have paid for some of our commodity crops under Title I. Uh, so I, I remain very concerned that it could be uh, that some of the committees of jurisdiction, we'll see what the House and Senate Ag Committees do in making recommendations to this joint committee, this super committee established through the debt ceiling uh, deal, uh, what kind of recommendations they'll make anticipating what may already sort of be coming at them, but trying to do it in a way that gives them more control rather than being reactive in writing the next Farm Bill in 2012, uh, and what recommendations they'll make by October 14th. Uh, I think that it's going to be hard to escape getting cut, uh, and there will be a lot of pressure to get a deal out of this joint committee because of then the pressure on the health care industry and the defense industry in the event of no deal. Uh, but I do think that having this opportunity by October 14th to make recommendations really gives the House and Senate Ag Committees an opportunity to go down on record where they think agriculture can do its share in getting our debt under control without having to take a disproportionate hit uh, compared to other programs across government. And hopefully they'll listen to the Ag Committees uh, on these matters. It's good to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Stephanie Herseth Sandlin, former uh, Congresswoman from South Dakota, our guest, and one of the speakers here at the American Coalition for Ethanol Conference in Des Moines. Good to see you. Thank you. All right. With that, we will wrap things up. Again, good attendance here. A lot of questions uh, facing the ethanol industry and uh, a lot of folks here to try to provide some of those answers and a lot of unknown still as we move forward. A lot of things very fluid and uh, in, in, you know, still in progress being worked on. So we'll keep you updated. Thanks for joining us today on AgriTalk, the voice of rural America. <laughs>